I attempted to make my own mod in Fields of Mistra, and it was way harder than I ever anticipated, to say the very least. I had a humble dream, just a girl with a goal to add a little quality of life to one of her favorite games. Oh, how naive that girl was, because prior to all of this, I had absolutely no modding experience. Unless you do count downloading mods, and even then, I was not really well versed after getting scarred for life by some virus-ridden Sims 3 custom content years ago. But in my defense, I do, as a matter of fact, know how to code. So I'm not woefully unprepared, but I am a little unprepared nonetheless. And I mean, how hard could it really be now as I've come to find out that completely depends on the scope of the mod I'm creating. To be fair, I don't think I'm reaching for the stars with the mod I want to implement, but I also didn't opt for the easiest option either. And you're probably asking yourself, what mod do you want to implement, L? Well, thanks for asking. I recently played through 100 Days of Fields of Mistria as a completionist. I wanted to complete as much as I could in those 100 days, and trust me, I did suffer for it with my time and especially with bug hunting. It took hours and hours for me to get all the legendary bugs within the first year. I hope that wasn't a spoiler for you because all of you obviously are already watched that video, and if you haven't, honestly, what are you doing with your life? Pause this video right now and come back in an hour and a half once you've been properly educated. But getting back on track, during my many bug hunts, I did have one reoccurring thought. What if I could just have a list of all the bugs that were loaded in the current map? Then I wouldn't have to ride around hoping to come across the bug I was searching for. Instead, I could spawn into an area on the map, check the list, and if I didn't see any bugs, I was interested in, I could just reload the map right away. Hours would be saved, my virtual legs would have less cramps, and my real life fingers would be letting out a sigh of relief. Now, I've been thinking this idea through for many weeks now, and I've had several thoughts about how to actually implement it in practice. Do I want it to be a pop-up, maybe activated by a button press, added to the journal perhaps? My mind, if I would let it, could come up with countless options, but if there is one thing I do know about coding, things might not go according to plan once you get into the weeds and start implementing the actual code. So for my sanity, the exact execution will be saved for when I get my little hands on the code. Speaking of the code, I hit up Google to see how exactly I could tinker with the code of Fields of Mystria. And well, spoiler alert, you can't. At least not directly. What I've learned is that Fields of Mystria is a game maker game. There is a modding tool for Undertale, which is another game made with Game Maker. So because of this commonality, we are able to use the Undertale mod tool. But Fields of Mystria is not packaged like Undertale. So while you can edit the sprites, look through the scripts, look at strings, you can't actually access the code directly. And I'll be honest with you, I thought this was where my journey would end. I saw some people messing around with JSON files, the Fiddle file specifically, but ultimately the mod I I want to make would need to have some coding involved. So I thought again, I had reached a dead end. But before I could crush my hopes and dreams even further, I thought, okay, let me just go recheck the Nexus mod page to see if there are any mods that I feel like did have some coding involved. Essentially what I was looking for to see if there was a mod that wasn't just adding anything cosmetic and wasn't something that you could just switch up easily in that fiddle file. And that's when I came across the Friday Night at the End Reminder mod. I saw it and knew there was no way that mod could be made without some scripting, so you better believe I investigated. Luckily, the creator of this mod, An Anomaly, had not only a link to the tools she used, but also a link to her GitHub. So not only could I use potentially those tools for myself, but I could also get an understanding of how she created her mod through her code. So turns out there's another tool, YY Toolkit, you can use to create mods in the game. It won't work on a Steam Deck 
apparently, but it does work on Windows, so you know what? I'll take what I can get. After some tinkering around and watching all the videos made by the Toolkit's creator, Archie, those videos will be linked in the description, I got the base template for the Toolkit up and running. Only, I was met with an error. Premature panic set in. I mean, I had only encountered roadblocks up to this point, so I was assuming the worst. I mean, I do love a good Stack Overflow deep dive, but with a lesser known tool, it is like the wild west out here for debugging, okay? Luckily for me, other people have run into this exact issue, so I didn't need to feel like the world was yet again crumbling down for more than a few minutes. I just needed to make an exception in my computer's defenses for my mods folder. Then the real work could begin. Right away, turn my attention to that Undertale modding tool since I did notice it had a list of available scripts that could be accessed with that toolkit. You bet I searched up bugs and went from there. If only it were that easy. YY Toolkit, from my understanding, allows you to intercept the results from these function calls, but you're pretty much at the mercy of both the toolkit and whatever the game gives you itself. So if a function returns results and they're undefined, you're just out of luck. If they return something like an object, you have to try and see if you can pull something useful from it. And even then, if it does return an object, there's no guarantee you'll be able to access any of those fields. Not to mention C++ is a little finicky. So if you're someone like me who hasn't really used C++ a lot, then you could also run into the issue of trying to access these variables incorrectly, which could make you think a value is invalid when it's actually not. You're just accessing it wrong. <laughs> Fun times. Needless to say, it was a whole process for me to explore both the load and spawn bug functions. I was still trying to get a grip on the toolkit while also trying to get valid results, but quite frankly, I was getting nowhere. So I thought, okay, big brain moment, let me look into items. I mean, the bugs are technically an item, but big brain moment, it was not because those bugs only become an item once you've caught them. In order for them to move around the map, they would need to be an object. So there went that idea. So I forced myself to go back to those load and spawn functions, this time with the help of ChatGPT. Don't get me wrong, she was helpful, but she is also kind of dumb. And I think this did make things a lot more convoluted for me. To sum it up, I wasn't able to use those functions and ChatGPT was feeding me me the wrong information. It was telling me the output was valid when it wasn't. It was referencing a different version of the toolkit than I was, but I guess that's also kind of on me because I should have checked the type mapping in the reference files sooner. At this point, I was thinking my idea was yet again impossible. I mean, I can't control that these functions are useless and not giving me what I want. I was seriously considering scrapping this entire idea and instead just modifying that fiddle file to allow for hundreds of bugs to spawn at once. But I had already sunk so many hours into this, it just didn't feel right to give up. I'm not a quitter, okay? So I looked into accessing some of the global variables, and there's that same potential problem here where the variables could be undefined. But as it turned out, there was a global bug variable. And let me tell you, I spent way too much time trying to pry at least something useful from this variable. And I really thought I was getting somewhere for a moment. The bug struct does have a spawn variable. I mean, could there be a more perfect variable for my needs? Turns out, yes, there could have been because I don't know what that spawn variable even is for or what it means. And that's another thing I learned. You might get valid results, but good luck interpreting them in some cases. To say the very least, I was desperate at this point, so I was combing through all those global variables and one did catch my eye, the bug distributions. So I thought, hey, let me look up some methods related to that. That's when I found functions related to candidates and voting, so I thought, okay, 
I'm making progress. Again, from my understanding, a bug has an attached rarity for the likelihood of it spawning, which gives it votes to the likelihood of it spawning at any given valid room load. Now, what else goes into that algorithm is anyone's guess because sometimes no bugs spawn, sometimes only one spawns, and sometimes the max number of bugs spawn as well. But that doesn't matter. What matters is that get candidate function actually does return something, a number. Now I just need to figure out what that number means and what to do with it. And trust me, that took me even more time. It wasn't matching up with the bug global variable. I was just getting one item in that array, so I needed to head elsewhere. And like I had mentioned, I noticed that bug distribution variable, and now I noticed it had a candidate ID. And would you look at that? The candidate ID has a match to the numbers outputted from the get candidate function. So I know that I can assume that this number corresponds to the bug and it doesn't correspond to the number of votes that the bug had received. And like I said before as well, a bug can be an item. So I brought in the global item variable and was able to match that candidate ID with the item ID to get the bugs that are spawned. My idea wasn't impossible after all, even if it took me hours and hours and hours. But let's get one thing clear. It's not perfect. I've mentioned before a bug can spawn in an area, but getting that max number of bugs to spawn is not guaranteed, but it will still be a candidate regardless of whether it spawns or not. Again, we don't really know the logic behind this algorithm, so it's hard to know exactly what's going on, but you know what? With how much time I have spent, this works for my standards, okay? So this all just means that the bug that my mod says are in the area are just options of what the bugs could be. So if you're at Hayden's farm and there's a two bug limit, it will always show you two bug options, but there is a possibility that only one of those spawned or both of those spawned. And trust me, it did get my hopes up when I was testing because it told me the flower crown beetle was there when it was not. So prepare for a little bit of disappointment, but I guess that's expected from how much trouble I went through to get this to work. It's close enough for me, okay? That's all that matters. But I was not done here. I had to make sure this bug list was showing up so that when you press the B button, I mean the B button for obvious reasons, then that list would show up and you could see what bugs were potentially out there in the map. And then, oh, I did need a way to clear the list because otherwise, if you go from your farm to Hayden's, it would have the bugs that spawned on your farm and the bugs that spawned on Hayden's and it all gets confusing. And I'm sure if you went all throughout the town, that list would get very long. I didn't want to just keep appending to that list for obvious reasons, so I needed to know when a new location would load up. Luckily, all the time I spent earlier was not a total waste because I was familiar with the spawn and load functions, so I knew I could use one of those functions that loads on room start for my needs. Only, that's not quite good enough because I do need to keep track of the location since bugs don't spawn in houses, so reset Setting the map by going inside a house or building won't reset the list because the function call would not get called when you enter inside Hayden's house, for instance. So I needed to use a more general load room script, which luckily did exist. And then I was finally done, at least with the coding part. I mean, isn't she just beautiful? Sure, the mod's not perfect, but no one's perfect, okay? I'll take what I can get. I mean, it only took me about two weeks in real life to to create this mod, but I'll admit she was worth every late night spent combing through the code. This mod, Els Bug List, is now available to download on Nexus Mods. I'll put that link in the description and you can download it if you'd like. I'd also like to take this time to thank Archie, the creator of YY Toolkit and An Anomaly, whose mod led me to finding YY Toolkit and whose code on GitHub was very helpful for understanding what I could do with this tool. Toolkit. With that, I want to thank you all for watching, subscribe if you like, and stay tuned for similar videos in the future. Bye!